Okay, welcome to the last uh, Thursday, uh, Tuesday demo les uh, lesson. This is um, the final one, which then of course is aiming at solving the entire Navier Stoke. Now you have all the necessary building blocks you need to solve the Navier Stokes numerically. And uh, this is then to give you a little bit background to solve uh, exercise number 12. You have here <coughs> been given the MATLAB uh, script, the uh, SULA code, which then I will go uh, through today and also the background for it. You have been given an article by uh, Gia et al, which is a quite famous uh, reference article. Old people are using that one when you are dealing with uh, CFD for comparison. It's the first uh, test case you try and see if you can match the solution given by, by these guys. And uh, yes, of course, you have been given the exercise test and uh, the text there in number 12. So today we will uh, go through the code and play a little around with it. But first of all, we are going to need some uh, background. Any questions before we begin? No. So I'll start on the blackboard a little bit. <coughs> there we go. <coughs> How to solve the Navier Stokes? The problem here, it's uh, Navier Stokes, it's two dimensional, it's transient, laminar. Of course, laminar. If it's turbulent, then you're going to need a turbulence model or solve it down to all the turbulence scales, which uh, is a very heavy task. So, this is our problem. Only two dimensional, Cartesian but uh, transient, depending on time. So we can have the time development uh, as well, if we like. How to solve it? We use what is called a projection method. Time split. You have several names for this uh, method. It's quite uh, famous, quite straightforward. Uh, you're going to get this one in the lecture anyway, so here I'll be uh, quite brief, sort of focusing on how this is done in this SULA algorithm only. But the more general uh, description you will um, be given by, by Millet. So uh, what is the projection method? Well. <coughs> Before I go into this one, I have to confuse you a little bit. Different notation. This is uh, very confu confusing. The tensor notation. With a tensor, you use indexes. And typically there, you will use i and j. So, <coughs> for instance, uh, say um, u i. Now i, the index i, does not mean the point in the x uh, direction as we normally would with uh, with the discrete uh, formulas. Now i means either one, two, or three, or if you like x, y, or z. It's just one component. And if you have uh, this one, um, say a term looking like this, like that, the ui, the xi, well, the x, that's not the x direction necessarily, depending on the index, 1, 2, or 3, if it's x, y, or z direction. But this is uh, typically a standard notation. And here I now have a term where I have the same indexes. That means automatically 
sum of all uh, uh, combinations when these two are equal. So this actually means in Cartesian coordinates du dx plus dv dy plus dw dz since I have the same index, uh, which then is, of course, the same as uh, the divergence of the velocity field. And just to confuse you even further, you have other tensor notations. They'll write it like this, i comma i. Everything after the comma should be derivative. So uh, u i comma i is actually in the divergence. So here you can write partial differential equations extremely compact. Impossible for normal people to read it. Not to mention start uh, dealing with the algebra on that form. That's very heavy indeed. But you risk meeting this tensor notation in, uh, in several uh, textbooks. So it's widely used. But now don't uh, be, be uh, scared if you sort of get confused here. I and J. Are they indexes for a numerical scheme, or are they tensor indexes? So uh, here I'm going to use both, just to be nasty for you. So let's try <coughs> the Navier-Stokes. Navier-Stokes, and then I pick the i component of the Navier-Stokes. How does it uh, look? Well. <coughs> the i component, then I start with ui and then time derivative. Then we have the convective terms, u d u d x and all these guys. They I, I can write on this form, uj and then derivative of ui dxj. Here a term with common uh, index, sum over all possible j's. So this will be du and then a u dx and then another du but now v dy and finally u and then uh, w dz. So there you have all three convective terms. On the other side, 1 over the density and the pressure gradient in the i direction. Skip the gravity and then finally viscosity and then double derivative of ui with respect to all directions. So here again you construct dxj, dxj. Construct a term where you sum over all possible uh, directions. So that sh should be now the i component of the Navier-Stokes. Any questions so far? We are still on tensor notation only. Uh, for the uh, convective term, these guys, here they are written on the form velocity in front of them and then a derivative. Normally people would like to have what's called then a conservative form. So you can rewrite it, uj dui dxj to be on the form derivative in front. How can you do that? Well, <coughs> if you just do it crudely, are these two equal? Well, not at first uh, glance, but uh, actually they, uh, they are. If you use the chain rule, Take one of them uh, on the outside, u i on the outside, and then what's left, du, du j x j, and then switch, u j outside, du i d x j. <coughs> and this one is zero for incompressible flow. That's the divergence of the velocity field. That's what I have here. <coughs> Whether it's uh, i or j, that doesn't matter. People are using uh, k, l, m, n, a lot of different uh, indexes, so that doesn't matter. So this one is a zero because 
the divergence of the velocity field here is in zero. We are focusing on incompressible flow. And uh, the way it's been done in Sula, <coughs> it's actually on this form. So uh, you can rewrite the convective terms using the continuity equation. So it's not on this form, it's on this form. Not that it matters, we are not going to uh, go into the details there anyway, but you should be, be uh, aware of it. Then <coughs> write the equation on a non-dimensional form. That's also a, a standard classic trick when you are fighting with a partial differential equation, <coughs> non-dimensional form. Okay, write it non-dimensional, you're going to need some velocity scales. So say now for this equation here, the Navier-Stokes that we are looking at, if all of them have dimensions, say use a wave on top of them or something, just to mark that all of these uh, quantities here, they have dimension. Wave and wave. Now, write it on a dimensionless form. <coughs> so the velocities, u, v, will now be uh, the, the one with dimension, and then we invent some velocity scale, u. And the uh, same goes with the distance. We are going to need a length scale of L. Pressure. How can we scale the pressure? You use a pressure. Well, since uh, the, the flow here is incompressible, density is constant. And then we just divide by rho and then velocity scale squared. That should give a non-dimensional pressure. And finally, you're going to need time. We don't have a time scale here in this problem or in this setup. So we have to invent one. That can easily be done with the velocity and the length. Here you have meters per second, divide by meters, and you have something with per second. So that should be the time scale. Uh, simple algebra now. You just insert all the quantities with dimensions to be now a non-dimensional form. And what will you obtain? Well, you get actually exactly what I started with, more or less. D, D, X, J, U, I, U, J equals, and then the pressure now only reads D, P, D, X, I. The density has disappeared. And then the viscosity, <coughs> and should be no surprise, here you will now have one over the Reynolds number in front of the viscous terms. D square ui dxj dxj. That is the equation that we are going to try to solve numerically. In uh, Sula, <coughs> SOLA stands for a solution algorithm, very simple algorithm actually, <coughs> founded in um, Los Alamos in the same 70s by Hurt, Nichols and Romero. It's quite famous code actually, free to use. And it's the shortest Navier-Stokes solver I've been able to find. Only a couple of pages, so not a big deal. In SOLA, <coughs> it's been programmed like this, u equals 1, l equals 1. So uh, you don't see any of these uh, scales. So you just have to be aware <coughs> if you want to take the results and later translate it to real numbers with dimensions. Okay, then you have to play around with scales. Have to be aware that the pressure you obtain from the Sula is actually the real pressure divided by the density and so on. So we have done it uh, fairly, fairly easy. Okay, solve this equation numerically. 
And uh, how do we solve it? We use the standard schemes, forward, time, central, space. So first order uh, Euler step in time, and then central uh, space differencing for uh, all the other terms. Now I have to start mixing uh, with the notation. Here it's a tensor notation, so don't con be confused now. Then I only look at this term. Discretize that one only. First order Euler scheme. So then I will write something like this. U, I, and now that's the I component of the Navier-Stokes, but the superscript N plus 1, that means the new uh, velocity. Then minus the old one, divided by delta T. And then I write it on the form equal to. So if I throw everything on the other side, you will have the pressure dp dx i minus convective terms dxj of ui uj and finally viscous term one over Reynolds number double derivative dxj dxj there you have it according to the standard formula for uh, Euler forward time the entire right hand side should be old values. All of these should be old. Velocity, time level, n, 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 and the pressure, n. And there actually you see the problem. You, yes, this is now an explicit uh, formula for finding the new velocity if you know everything at time level n. Uh, yes, that's true, but how can we update the pressure? We don't have an equation saying time derivative of pressure equals anything. This is incompressible, so, so uh, mm, we are sort of uh, one equation short here. We can never update the pressure if we do it like this. So uh, this recipe, no, can't be done. It will uh, not work. If you do this, then you will find here a velocity field which in general will not satisfy the continuity equation. It's going to be wrong. So what I would like to have was this one. I would have liked to have the new pressure there as well. But sadly, now this one is implicit. I have one equation here with two unknowns. This is not possible. OK, what is possible? Well, we use the old pressure anyway. Since uh, as, as the first guess, we have no, really have no choice. But then I have to admit that the velocity uh, that I find, it's not the correct one. It's not n plus 1. It's uh, what we call a tentative velocity field, sort of a half step. It's time split, so this is now the first step. Calculate uh, the tentative velocity field based on the old pressure. So here it will be minus n uh, p to the power of uh, p uh, superscript n. But the other term will be exactly the same. So that's the only difference. And that equation is fairly easy to, to uh, deal with. That one is explicit. Given everything on time level n, you can easily find the u star, the tentative velocity field. It's not correct, but it's a first step towards a better and new solution. So, uh, we are still lost of one equation here. So how can we uh, find the correct one? Subtract these two equations. Take the top minus the bottom. What do you get? Well, you will have uh, ui n plus 1 minus u star over delta t equals, what do you get on the other side? Well, these terms, acceleration terms, viscous terms, they will disappear because they are the same. So it's only the pressure that uh, survives. So what do we get here? Something called uh, minus, what will it be? 
xi derivative of actually the pressure difference the new pressure minus the old one there you have it it still doesn't help I'm left with one equation here and two unknowns so it doesn't really help somewhere along the line here you have to use another equation which one of course you use the continuity take the divergence of this equation here so you use an operator on it d d x i on the entire equation what are you left with well <coughs> you will have on the uh, left hand side one over delta t and then you will have um, what will it be d u i n plus one d x i minus d u i star d x i and then on the other side minus double derivative dxi dxi of the pressure difference and then you can use the continuity equation you can't really tell anything about this tentative velocity field that's the fixtures velocity it's not real but we know something about the new unknown velocity one thing is for sure he's going to satisfy the continuity equation then we can get rid of him so he disappears since divergence of the velocity field is going to be zero. Then we are left with now one equation with one unknown, the new pressure. And as you can see, it's actually a Poisson equation for the unknown pressure. You have the double derivative equal to something that is now familiar. You so you have to calculate this u star first. So you can rewrite this equation if you like. Nabla square of the pressure difference equals, and what do you have on the other side? You have one over the time step, and then the divergence of this tentative velocity field. There you have it. <coughs> So, what will the algorithm be? First step, you can calculate the, uh, the U star, the tentative velocity field. So, this one, that is the first step. <coughs> uh, let's write that one up here. Projection method. <coughs> Calculate U star. That's the first step. When you know U star can be found explicit from this uh, formula, you know everything from time level n. Then solving this one, that should be the second step. Find the new pressure. And that requires a solution of an elliptic equation. So that one has to be solved for Pn plus 1. And then the final step, having found the new pressure, then it should be possible to find the new uh, velocity. And then we use this equation down here. The difference between n plus 1 and star. So, uh, having found the new pressure, this, then we can calculate u n plus 1 explicitly. Calculate for u n plus 1. That's the entire alg algorithm. You find uh, u star, easy, cheap solve a Poisson equation. That's where you have to burn all the CPU. That's the expensive part, finding uh, the pressure there for uh, that's an elliptic equation. But then finally, update the new velocity field. That doesn't cost uh, much. 
So no, not a problem there. Any questions to that one? No? Let's have a look at the code then. <coughs> So here is, no, not yet, not yet, sorry, there mm -mm. we go. <coughs> here you have uh, the code given to you for exercise number 12. So you don't have to do any programming initially. You can actually just hit on the run button and uh, the code should uh, start uh, running. So well, we can try it. So uh, he's then running and running and running and finally then hopefully produce some sensible results. Hopefully. You get five different uh, graphs out of this. Uh, I'll look at this one later. Let's look at uh, the streamline picture. So this is the classical square cavity test case. You have a box one by one. Remember, non-dimensionalized. And at time equals zero, the top wall starts to move with a constant velocity of one. And then due to viscosity, you will then have a big center vortex. And depending on the Reynolds number, you will have some secondary vortices. Here, Reynolds number 1000, you should have three. Down in the corners here and also one up here somewhere. It's too small to even see. Um, so that is the standard uh, test case for a square cavity. And here we will only be interested in the steady state situation. It's going to take some time before this one has, has developed, but we have to run all the way to the steady state before we start comparing results. Also what you get here is uh, pressure contours. Not so interesting. Low pressure in the center, of course and then high pressure to the top right. So uh, the problem here, looking at the velocity vectors, the problem is uh, very simple geometrically. So that's why people like it, very easy to set up. But the physics is quite complex actually. So it's a vis viscosity driven uh, flow and the picture uh, it can be quite complex actually. <coughs> So uh, this is the setup, Reynolds number 1000. But is it correct and how correct is it and so on and so forth? That's the task for exercise 12. So here I'll go through a little bit of the logic inside the code. <coughs> you have been given the number of unknowns, 20. That means you have a 20 by 20 internal cells. So uh, 20 by 20 unknowns multiplied with 3, because you have two velocity com components and the pressure. The epsilon, that is the accuracy. Coming back to that one. And then we are solving uh, the uh, Poisson equation for the pressure using an SOR, which you now are familiar with. That means we have to find a decent uh, omega, an over relaxation parameter. And here I just do it by simple interpolation. I've done uh, several simulations, um, different unknowns, and then found uh, uh, sort of, uh, not the optimum maybe, but a good omega. And then he will now inter interpolate among these values to find a, find a fairly good one. You see the omega values, M closer and closer to two, the more unknown you have. It's quite typical. Then <coughs> the input for this code is actually only the, Re the Reynolds number. That's the only single parameter we have in the problem, since we have written it on a non-dimensional form. The velocity scale is one. Um, okay, length scale is one. There's only the Reynolds number left. So you specify the Reynolds number as an input. Of course, time. 
now that's a big question. How long time do we have to simulate? And then, what should the time step be, delta t? Now that is a headache, of course. Now we have to think in terms of stability. So there is up to you to play around with uh, that number and see if you can make it explode. And uh, trust me, that's fairly easy. Eta max. <coughs> that is the maximum iterations allowed in the SOR to solve the Poisson equation for the pressure. That's also something you can play around with. Now remember, this is a transient code. So, uh, but here we are interested only in the steady state solution in the end. That means we don't really have to solve the, the uh, Poisson equation correct at every time level, since we are only interested in the steady state. If you are interested in the correct time development of a problem, aha, then this one has to be solved on every time step quite accurately. But if it's only a steady state, ah, then you can uh, cheat this one a little bit and then sort of use time as an iterative dimension. But of course, then you are going probably to need more time steps. Uh, so then this maximum time will not be real. But still possible to find a steady state situation that way. H <coughs> meaning uh, delta X and delta Y, so you have the same number of cells in both uh, directions, I'm sort of hard coded in here. This beta is just a parameter we used uh, in the SOR calculations. And here <coughs> you define all your variables, U, V, and W. And as you can see, they have been dimensioned uh, N plus 2 in both x and y directions. So we are going to use number 1 and number n, n plus 2 as uh, boundary cells or boundary values. Here <coughs> you have been given uh, the stability control. It is not perfect. It's uh, quite a simple uh, stability analysis, but you have three different demands for delta t. And uh, actually, to be dead certain for a, a solution, all three of them should be fulfilled. Uh, here in this program, if you violate it, he will give you a warning and then a pause. But you just hit enter and then the code will still run or try to run. If you are using uh, two big delta t, so we are violating some of these stability criteria. So uh, the first one actually will be uh, the Kuna friedrich levy condition. The other one, they are more uh, complex. I don't think uh, they can this course cover the stability analysis behind uh, those. So uh, don't worry too much about it. But uh, feel free to violate the stability criteria and see what happens. It's also a task in, in exercise 12. Okay, then we have the main time loop <coughs> for all time steps. Then we start here with a double loop. Here you calculate the tentative velocity field U and V. So they will be given with uh, these two uh, expressions. And now, of course, I and J are the normal uh, central space uh, differencing for all the different uh, terms in the entire Navier-Stokes. Note here that you have the pressure difference here. That is a derivative for the pressure in the x-direction for u and down here in the y-direction for v, but it's based on the old pressure from the previous time step. So u and v here at this point is indeed the tentative velocity field. They will then in general not be fulfilling the continuity equation. So we are only the first step done so far. Then we do a lot of pressure iterations as we call it here. That is using an SOR for finding the new pressure. Here they have done it quite elegant. Not only do they update the pressure, but they update the velocity at the same time. That's something new. So uh, it's 
quite tricky actually to see it that this is an SOR for the Poisson equation. But believe me when I say it is. It's just uh, written on a quite smart form, quite compact. So you update the velocities at the same time. Uh, you started with the U star, this tentative uh, velocity field, but we sort of use these two steps in one single operation. So we are solving this one using the SOR directly at the same time. So I won't go through uh, the details there, just trust me when I say that is what's uh, been done. Also what's nice here, <coughs> you calculate the divergence numerically for every cell, for every single time step. And also here for every iteration. So then you have a physical uh, interpretation of the accuracy here. Normally you would say we solve a Poisson equation and then you will uh, sort of uh, calculate and calculate and calculate until how long? When, do you, when are you satisfied? When you do you have a solution? Well, you will say like the resist, uh, like the total residual is smaller than some prescribed value, uh, something like that. But here you can actually check if this divergence, which is a physical quantity, if that one is smaller than here, the prescribed value for epsilon, then you say I'm satisfied. So here you have a stopping criteria for the, uh, for the uh, SOR that's physical. And that's uh, sort of a, a tremendous advantage to have a real physical uh, demand for accuracy. So uh, if he is uh, satisfied for all cell cells, then he will break out of this, uh, uh, this loop. Or uh, you have uh, done uh, too many uh, iterations here. So, uh, so uh, you can see here, <coughs> you get a warning if you have done all the maximum allowed uh, iterations for the SOR, he will just uh, say, uh, warning, this is uh, not a good solution for the uh, Poisson equation. I mean, remember up here you prescribed an epsilon. That means all the divergence in every single cell has to be smaller than this number before he is satisfied. And then it's a question, will that happen within the 300 maximum allowed uh, pressure iterations? So here, of course, if you go down to the level, uh, say, you can only use maximum three pressure iterations for every uh, time step, then definitely that's uh, not going to happen, at least in the beginning. So uh, you can see down here for the, uh, in the command window, the printout. He prints out for every time step the actual number of uh, iterations uh, used. And in the end, you see he doesn't use many. And in the beginning, uh, I don't have the beginning here. Let's try to make a beginning if we restart it. And then I crash him. Well, now he crashed instantly. That was good. Here, now I had only maximum three iterations, pressure, pressure iterations. And then, of course, you get a warning and he prints out the divergence for you. So uh, three, that's clearly not enough. And then also you see what happens. The divergence uh, explodes. And finally, uh, not a number detected and then uh, he aborts. If we go back to 300, as it was, and rerun, and crash him, just to get the beginning. So the first time step, he didn't need uh, many, but remember you start with everything equal to zero, which is actually a solution. But uh, after uh, the first time step, the top wall has begun to move. Okay, then uh, he's going to now need a lot of pressure iterations to solve the Poisson equation. 
almost a hundred. But then uh, he is actually satisfied only with 35, 34, 38, 40, and then 40. This will also be a function of your time step. If you try to increase the time step, then he's going to do more work uh, to find the correct solution. Remember, then you will have bigger, change, uh, bigger changes over one single time step. So I can show you if we increase the time step by a factor of 10. Try to run that one. There you get a warning. Delta T should be smaller than and then the original number. But never mind that, we run anyway. And then I crash him. So he actually survives with, uh, with a delta T 10 times as large. But now you see he's going to need more pressure iterations for every time step to keep the, the, uh, the uh, accuracy. So feel free to play around with it. Okay. What about the rest of the code then? It's not uh, that much. A couple of uh, tests. <coughs> the final one here. Here you check if not a number uh, has appeared somewhere. Actually, I only test for the uh, for the U uh, velocity field. So is none. He will be true. That means one. If one of these numbers is uh, not a number, and then he breaks out of the main loop and finished. And then the final part. That's just cosmetics. Plotting the uh, velocity vectors pressure contours, finding the stream functions, and then compare with, uh, with this um, GIA article, the data from that one. It's been hard-coded, as you can see, so you don't have to do it. The numbers are given, so we are comparing the velocity uh, with uh, the values from this article. Okay, any uh, questions? from you guys. So what we are missing now is the geometry, the layout, choice of uh, mesh system, and we have to peek a little bit into the boundary conditions, how this one can be set up. But that will be after the break.